Namaste and a very warm welcome to the eminent panel here along with Rajiv Ji. We have Professor B.S. Murthy, Director of IIT Hyderabad and a former professor at IIT Madras in the Department of Metallurgy and Material Engineering. We have with us Professor Lakshman Nilakantan, who is also with the Department of Materials, uh, Metallurgy and Materials Engineering. We have Professor Mani Vannan from IIT Madras, who is a professor at the Department of Applied Mechanics and is a professor of Biomedical Engineering. And of course, we have Rajiv Ji, a very, very well-known uh, author, influencer, uh, Indic civilizational expert, and more importantly, he has been leading a campaign to document the history of Indian science and technology in about 21 volumes. If you go to indianscience.org website, you get a detailed view of the effort that's going on. It's an ongoing effort, that's what I understand. So what are we going to talk about in this panel discussion? The title is a very, very intriguing one. It's about encouraging advanced students project leveraging our Indian scientific and technological contributions and heritage. It's an important topic. The reason being that India is yet to come to broader terms about how they have been, how we have been contributing for a long period of time, for several thousands of years, if I may say so, to the knowledge base, knowledge systems of science, engineering, technology, for the betterment of humanity at large. And that's very, very important. And it is in that context. Let me introduce myself. My name is Mohan. And I happen to be a founder of a small consulting company called Pragyan Data Labs. Earlier, I used to work as a principal as a scientist at uh, Infosys. And more importantly, I am also a managing trustee of a trust called the Foundation for Indian Civilization Studies. And that's exactly why I'm here. I shall be your moderator, sir. So this topic has been something which many people have been wanting India to come to terms with, contemporary India, right? And the reason being very simple. There is a lot of challenges that is coming up in the way of people trying to understand what our contributions are. We don't want to have a false pride, but neither should we have a pride which is not really reflecting our true contributions as a civilization. So the point is to be able to come to terms with the fact that we can do a better job blending and bringing in the continuity. You know, if our forefathers had been great scientists, why are we not bringing in that continuity? And that's exactly what is, that's exactly what needs to happen in many of the universities and uh, uh, centers of higher learning in India, and more specifically. It's also a case where we need to have incentives built into it so that youngsters, researchers, professors, and the public at large who are really interested in science and engineering and technological contributions of India over the thousands of years get to actively contribute to solve the pressing problems of society, combining with what is current latent knowledge. And that's very important. So this is what I just wanted to share. That incentivization has been done with a very interesting example. There's this Vishwakarma Prize getting uh, given to the BTEC project students at the convocations for an outstanding project that combines both our scientific heritage as well as modern approaches to problem solving to solve pressing problems of our society. So on that note, what I'm planning to do is to have a request for uh, 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 our Rajiv Malhotra, right? He's a professor in a certain way. He's a scientist in a certain other way. So I'm kind of getting it out. And I hope Rajivji, you will not mind that. But what's important is Rajivji, you have been pioneering this effort to get this history of science and technology of India, our Indic civilization in a documented way. Can you share with us your thoughts on this? And what do you think about our topic? The topic of encouraging uh, uh, advanced student projects to leverage Indian scientific and technological contributions and heritage. Rajiv. Thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Mohan. So my own background is originally as a physicist and then as a computer scientist, uh, where I specialize in artificial intelligence. That was uh, 50 years ago. 
I, I came, actually this month, 50 years ago, I came to the United States. Uh, I was 20. I came as a PhD student in uh, physics and then switched to computer science. Uh, and so that's been my, my own uh, uh, you know, scientific background. But then halfway, uh, uh, halfway into my career, after about 25 years, I switched over to, I gave up all that. I had uh, got quite a lot of career success. Uh, I gave up all that in order to start uh, my foundation and go into uh, civilization. So I first half of my career was in science technology uh, as, a, as a practitioner. Uh, and then in the second half of my career, it's been into civilization. So the two things that uh, uh, Dr. Mohan wants to bring together are the two parts to my, cult, my career. So the reason I uh, got interested in the history of Indian science and technology uh, as one of the first projects of our foundation uh, is that I was inspired by Joseph Needham at Cambridge, who is no more, of course, uh, who created 30 volumes on Chinese science and technology history. And this had become uh, standard uh, you know, in every library in the world when they study China, they study its uh, scientific culture. Uh, and one of the reasons given why India was studied as a kind of a basket case, poor, uh, all kind of problems and nothing scientific about it is because there was a lack of such a reference work. This is what uh, the, the people in Cambridge who were published the uh, Joseph Needham series told me that their, their primary readership are think tanks all over the world. Uh, I'm talking about 70s and 80s. Uh, and 90s, long before the rise of China. So I thought uh, that I, we, somebody should do something similar for India. Uh, I approached the uh, Indian Education Ministry at that time. I approached science and technology people at the time. I approached all kinds of people. Nobody was helping, nobody was interested. Uh, so we started our own project uh, and we, uh, we've uh, put out 14 volumes. Uh, it was originally meant to be a 20 volume project for just the material, physical based technologies, not theoretical sciences. We are not talking about, uh, you know, some theory. Those would be subsequent series, but the first series was going to be only um, things that can be proven with physical evidence, like metallurgy, like uh, ceramic tiles, like uh, uh, water, water projects, water harvesting projects and dams and all that, like agriculture, uh, you know, like textiles. So things where you have physical evidence and you can, re you can take a claim a scientific or technological claim, and you can verify it by validating it. Uh, so uh, we discovered many things. We discovered, for instance, uh, the India, India pioneered a lot in metallurgy. Uh, zinc distillation happened in India before anywhere else. Uh, in Rajasthan, uh, we funded each of these volumes is a three-year project. We funded and we wanted it to be entirely uh, Indian people based in India doing the research and international people being given a chance to do a peer review and critical analysis. Each volume went through a lot of that. And we found that uh, we found many pioneering things that India had done in textiles, in, in metallurgy, zinc, for instance, as I gave you an example, steel, uh, and so on. Uh, and the purpose was not nostalgia or arrogance or emotion and all that stuff. Uh, the purpose was to figure out what can we learn from the, uh, from the past how was this technology done? Who funded it? Who did it? Why did it go waste? And why did it stop? What happened? Why it got disrupted? How do we revive this? We learned several things. Uh, one of the things we learned was that Indian technology like metallurgy was not static. The people making zinc, uh, you know, pure zinc by distilling it, uh, you know, you, they had invented retorts. I mean, they had in, invented a lot of uh, you know, what, what we thought that maybe the Europeans have invented, but these guys invented it centuries earlier. And there, uh, when, when the archaeologists go and study their factories, their manufacturing, uh, every hundred years it's improved. The technology was X and then it becomes a next level, then it becomes next level. The quality of uh, output and the quantity became better. And this happened with steel, this happened with all kinds of things. This happened with textiles, this happened with uh, building uh, irrigation systems. So uh, uh, India is not, India's heritage is not frozen in time that you just memorize something in the past and you are, you got perfect knowledge. Uh, Indians believed in perfecting, improving R&D, uh, you know. Uh, so the idea of improvement is there in the Indian system. But today, when they talk, when they do a seminar on Indian traditional knowledge, they just can go and quote something that came from here, that came from there. And uh, it's good for inspiration, but that's not science. Science is not uh, 
I mean, you don't become a scientist if you just uh, study the life of Einstein and quote what he said. I mean, you have to apply it today. And you have to critically analyze it. You have to improve it. And you have to apply. You have to you know move it forward. So the 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 one of the things we learned is that the, even though we were able to inspire a large movement, I'm talking about in the 90s when we started this. After five, ten years of doing this and having conferences every year in different parts of India, we were able to inspire a lot of uh, people in IITs and other other places to start taking Indian knowledge systems seriously. Uh, and and uh, uh, but that Indian knowledge system study that started was more about uh, you know kind of uh, reciting something from the past rather than uh, using it as a foundation to go into the future. So I'll stop with that because I'm sure there'll be more yes. opportunities fact, to come. In. Uh, I think uh, it's really really nice to have uh, two very eminent professors in the world of. metallurgy and material engineering join us here in this panel along with of course professor manivanan uh, who is into applied mechanics department but uh, doing great job wonderfully contributing to what indigenous indic thinking and science and technologies all been uh, through the world of biomedical engineering so i'll just take a minute to uh, jump to the topic but before that let me kind of take a minute again to introduce the actual eminences here so let me start with professor bs murthy uh, professor bs murthy has uh, got his phd from indian institute of science of course he is the director of iit hyderabad right now and is doing a fabulous job trying to integrate our indigenous indian indic knowledge systems with the way contemporary studies are going on so it will be really fruitful and worthwhile for making things happen for students to be more grounded in how they have been adding value through their heritage and through their contemporary learnings so professor muthi has been a member of indian national academy of engineering indian national science academy and has been the recipient of shanti swarup bhatnagar award professor muthi if i may kind of request you this and ask you this question what ails the encouragement of advanced students project that blends that leverages our indian scientific and technological heritage in our contemporary society it's a very tough question i know and it has a lot of historical uh, background i would say uh, we we quite a bit um, most of the youngsters uh, and including people of our age groups what we lack is a self confidence in ourselves believing in ourselves for example when i was a btech student in metallurgy i was taught that the steel was first made by bessemer okay and i grew up like that okay until i came to iic bangalore and met a great gentleman by name professor ranganathan who opened up my eyes and said that there is so much much before great grandfathers of bessemer were ever born that there were great steels made in this country okay and that's yes. uh, so so for example woods uh, many of you must know steel yeah, exactly steel something that can cut a helmet into two pieces okay a uh, right. uh, lot of people are still working even now to see if we can you know replicate that steel uh, more important oh, it's a it's a steel with about higher uh, 1.4% carbon and most of our metal at least we know that 1.4% carbon steel is brittle uh, and such a steel, uh, steel they are may able to make it like a sword okay which is like a sheet right. of metal to make exactly. a high carbon steel into a sheet of metal what kind of thermo mechanical processing that people have to go through all this was possibly known 2000 years back in india so these all the things which made me so excited and then started looking at more importantly and, and even put my finger into can we really make some of these uh, so i started interacting with a sanskrit scholar for almost 10 years i ran behind a sanskrit scholar we started making some <laughs> nano particles uh, based on certain you know uh, uh, scripts in these uh, old and scripts so i strongly believe what is important for all of us to start uh, and and when i did all this there was so much of ridicule all around me okay with my own colleagues in the whole institute i remember when i brought him to give an eml lecture extramural lecture the way 
people you know kind of ridiculed the whole thing clearly gives an idea that we somehow do not uh, uh, try to uh, possibly respect our own knowledge okay until yeah, somebody exactly. uh, comes from outside and tells you that this is a great knowledge uh, you you keep on uh, you know i feel uh, kind of uh, uh, disowning uh, if i can even say that right. and that is something that all of us yeah, have to learn and i'm going to, I'm going mind. to do that at iit hyderabad i'll come to it a little later how to uh, you know uh, uh, bring changes in the way people want to i'll come okay. to it so the, i'm sure rajiv ji has a lot of strong views on this colonization of the mind afflicting a lot of indians not only within india but across the world so let me kind of uh, go to professor manivannan who is with the Dipl- department of applied mechanics and uh, he's been a visiting scientist at mit and nist as well in the us and he has been the founder of the haptics touch lab at iit madras and has been promoting the uh, indic uh, knowledge of alternative medicines in india in a very big way and of late in treating corona early stage uh, patients too so professor manivannan did his masters and phd from iic and i'm glad to share that sometimes perhaps we would have met because i did my masters and phd from iic as well on that note i just want to share that uh, i want to ask you this question which is what we thought we should discuss right what ails this encouraging advanced students projects being uh, uh, done leveraging our indic knowledge systems what do you say sir what's your view on this we are not able to hear you sir can you unmute you are unmute, unmute manivannan ah. yes yeah now you are uh, on thank you professor mohan and uh, thank you for the organizers to arrange this uh, such a wonderful panel of experts so uh, to answer your question on uh, how to encourage the young minds i completely agree with the professor ps muthi that uh, uh, the self confidence is little lacking with our students so probably we love to you know motivate our students we have to educate our students uh, i have a no uh, uh, no feeling and i all strongly believe that uh, we have a very strong scientific uh, society in the past but somehow we have completely lost and um, the field in which i am working in biomedical engineering if you look at it the central theme of biomedical engineering is that definition of life can you imagine in the new scientific you know uh, modern medicine or modern science there is no proper definition of life but uh, our students are not aware of it whereas in our right. society the whole society is around this concept of life definition of life how to you know nurture the life how to improve the life so uh, i was and, very startled to you know learn all our science and from and, this, and, you know, and we do it all of this we do it in a very scientific and objective way that's the more important part completely scientific our society was scientific right now we are exactly. our society is, right now the current society is not scientific i would say whereas our earlier yes. society is completely scientific as far as this Wonderful. life is concerned the whole our customs yes. tradition is around this concept of life the entire realm of engineering i was Wonderful. very happy so uh, some of we have to take this to the students and then motivate them to look into our world and science the way in which that science is understood now by the modern science is completely not right we need to now right. put a new perspective is what i would say thank you wonderful 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 sir i really like this concept of uh, you describing that the society is intrinsically scientific when it focuses on keeping life in the center of its living and that's very important because we want to be objective we want to lead a very very meaningful uh, holistic life and in order to do that obviously we have to be scientific and therefore the scientific heritage of india for the past several thousands of years and that's a very nice capture in fact on that note i'd like to go to professor lakshman who has done his phd from the uh, max planck institute uh, in germany and he is a professor at the department of metallurgy and uh, um, materials engineering at iit madras and uh, he has been very actively interested in 
the world of electrochemistry, surface modifications, corrosion, as well as nano tubes, all of which is related to what Professor B.S. Murthy was mentioning, especially in terms of how wood steel got done, God knows how, but then it's a very interesting scientific contribution from India, as well as the pillar, the rustless pillar in Delhi. So, Professor Lakshman, what do you say? What ails our efforts in trying to get our students to use the technological contributions of our forefathers, blend it to the contemporary sciences and solve pressing problems of the society. So what ails us, Professor Lakshmi? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Mohan, and uh, thank you all uh, for providing me this opportunity. First of all, I would like to say myself, whether I'm an expert or not, still, I won't agree myself that I'm an expert. Let me put that way. Coming to your question, what ails? I think that's a very humble way of starting in a typical Indic style. But then uh, I know we are all here to hear you in big, deep ways, sir. Continue. Yeah. Uh, so what ails? Uh, see, uh, if I rewind back our general day-to-day -day activities as a child, the very first story we heard from our grandmas all has science in it. For example, the crow water story, throwing stone into it. That's a quite evident of Archimedes' principle, right? So we were right. imbibed with it. We grew up with it. But what hasn't is we have a loss of memory as we go up and we started looking westwards or upwards and anything other side of the shore is always green. That's what I would, everybody thinks so, number one. And number two, we are even now not very proud to say we have this. We have to admit that. I, I had many right. arguments with my friends when I was doing my PhD that every ritual or every spiritual, you name it superstitious, but I always see there is science and technology associated with it. We have to admit Wonderful. that part. There are negatives, but we have to admit the positives and start thinking about it. As Professor Murthy pointed out in metallurgy, uh, there are a lot of examples which many scientists cannot be done true uh, even today. For example, the rustless wonder. It was Professor yes. Balasubramaniam, if I remember, uh, a professor from IIT Kanpur, unfortunately, is not here live. If you look at his work, today I am teaching that in the classroom for the students. So one thing that we have to sensitize the student that these are our great heritages. Yes, we have lost connectivity, but still we can revive it. And with respect to an immediate action, I would say is let's be proud of our past, focus towards forward. At IITs, even I take this opportunity to talk to my head, we should have a subject on heritage metallurgy related with heritage to start and give them the feel of the greatness of our country. And then you proceed further in their directions of taking it to the next generation possible. That's what's my wonderful, comment on wonderful, this point. Wonderful, Professor Lakshman. That's a very nice way of putting it. Your, your example of showing how even our folklore had a certain scientific basis in the way stories were spun out. You need to have flights of imagination, but at the core, there will be some scientific principle, perhaps. And that's very interesting. The crow and the stone and the jug of water and how the crow drank the water from the jug. That's a very nice grandma story based on some scientific foundations. So let me now invite Professor Sampath Kumar, who has joined us. Professor Sampath Kumar has been with the Department of Metallurgy and Material Engineering at IIT Madras. And he has been an expert who's applying nano apatite based uh, uh, multi-modal drug delivery systems, novel approaches to it, as well as imagining, imagining systems. Apart from it, he is into surface uh, featuring of metallic implants, like in the world of dentistry and about uh, researching on antimicrobial materials. Professor Sambat Kumar, I have this question for you, right? Yes. See, we have a very interesting situation where the reason why we are so scientific and uh, what do you call rational in our outlook in a certain holistic way is primarily because it's been running in our blood, right? And if you look at the past, especially in the Indic context, Indian uh, uh, citizens or Indian civilizational contribution to the knowledge systems at large for the humanity has been very strong in the world of science and technology okay, over the past several thousands of years. So what ails the usage of such uh, knowledge in the contemporary context by the youngsters, like students pursuing their annual projects, in solving pressing problems as a society, what else? The, what is the problem? What are the challenges there? Your thoughts, sir. Wonderful. That's what exactly my the percent uh, uh, the award uh, work was related to exactly that one. Uh, 
uh, just briefly right. what we what we done was basically we know that people use neem sticks to clear no to you know clear the teeth in the right. morning actually and we know those old people they are old but they are the full you know healthy teeth and they don't have cavity at all and about few years back no we in chennai we had a heavy you know uh, uh, low pressure and all the trees have been you know truncated they were down actually so we, there is a neem tree in our area so actually thinking talking to my students you no know, what is special you no know, why people are using neem so we have taken the neem sticks from the broken and fallen tree and uh, we started doing lining extraction and we found out there is a particular chemical there in only the neem stick not on the either the leaves or other things and that are commercially there and this really helps in the avoiding cavity formation so basically this wow. functional knowledge there we found out scientifically and uh, with uh, the btech student we are able to you know identify what is a major constituent and ultimately shown it's good for uh, you know uh, good be good, good basically there's other issue which is there i have a dental student as research scholar she told uh, for the young children if they about have a cavity there will be a small deep discoloration will be there yellow color they call it incipient caries actually at that stage you give a chemical that it they won't have a cavity will avoid the cavity formation so once a cavity point you have to go for filling only we you know recommended so, that so, so, so that's let me just kind of come in now i just wanted to ask you so here's a very beautiful example that you gave of how a traditional usage of a common indian habit of brushing teeth with neem had such a wonderful scientific basis and obviously it has been done over a period of time perhaps to trial and error method but then with such a fantastic results that it got widespread adoption in the society now my question to you is there are several such instances of scientific uh, knowledge which have a everyday applicability in the common masses and people have been doing this for perhaps several thousands of years now if a student were to understand it try to leverage it and try to solve a little more pressing problem right what kind of challenges do they face what is the problem what ails this entire effort how do you encourage these kinds of advanced projects that's the question i would like to it if you told the student to answer that exactly if you stated told the student it's only for the neem extraction they will not we are more metallurgy what we motivated them right. now, like the, we talked about nanotechnology say we have a nano carrier so we were able to give a modern scientific way of expressing that problem understanding that actually that oh, only done the that's delicate. very interesting that's what we done that's we very interesting for a nano carrier extract the molecule in fact this hardcore metallurgy student have done extraction of the neem stack actually so it motivated them beautiful and this particular student that was muthi my colleague also there is basically not a very top student she has lot of backlog actually but doing the course she is able to get a award also her lifestyle i know her background really changed right so very happy about it there is the modern science and technological understanding and there are this beautiful traditions which have been long lasting for several hundreds of thousands of years and there's a scientific basis to it so you combine both to understand the uh, synergy there and that in turn actually transforms a student and gives a certain purpose of life in that they go out and they are able to make out of box thinking based lateral thinking based contributions in their profession that's a very interesting point so let me come back to rajiv ji rajiv ji you have heard the professors speak about the lack of self confidence in students the fact that there is a very important thing to uncover the scientific basis of our folklore and traditions and habits and attitudes and the fact that there is a need to be able to leverage and get this forward despite uh, being ridiculed etc so what's your take on all of this rajiv ji what do you think we can do what should we do how should we go about it and uh, what what do you what's your response to all these observations of the professors so you know rajiv ji one of the one of the important uh things that has to happen is in order to interest people to take this up is that it has to be relevant to their career today if right. there is no job opportunity i mean if i go and study something and i cannot make a practical application i cannot get a patent i cannot invent something i cannot take it to market today i mean if i could make wood steel and uh, become a steel manufacturer and have a very specialized application Uh, i i you know if there is commercial value I, i i could probably get a top job as a scientist or something in a steel company that's great uh, uh, if i can uh, uh, use this neem uh, technology for for uh, you know our teeth and all that and learn it learn to 
use it for some modern medical kind of application, that's great. So I, I feel that it has to be usage, pragmatic usage for today, not for nostalgia. It has to be, it has to be something where there is a potential for application uh, over and above whatever modern uh, alternatives exist. So if you can make steel better than modern alternatives, or if you can uh, improve your teeth and the cavity or any other health thing better than the modern manufactured uh, toothpaste, uh, you have uh, you you create uh, excite a lot of people. So besides the uh, the inferiority complex which was mentioned and the fear and uh, lack of self confidence and so on, that's a factor I, I've talked about a lot. But in, instead of in, in addition to that, you also have the factor of is it pragmatic for today? Is does it have economic viability? Will it create jobs? Uh, will it will it make me chief scientific officer in uh, some steel company in Mittal or Tata's or somewhere if I develop this, uh, uh, or not? And 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 if the answer is it won't, then then you know then the, there are fewer people who will take it up as a long term career option because they don't know what they'll do with it. What's the value? So that is that is uh, one point I, I wanted to make. Another point I wanted to make is more of a question. Uh, how did, what was the methodology for discovering these things in the past? Uh, how did, uh, you know, P uh, the Indian scientists uh, develop a, a particular metallurgy uh, without a theoretical model in those days? Or how did they uh, how did they develop? The, how did they uh, understand that this neem uh, stick, out of thousands of trees and all that, it is this particular stick that will have this property, without laboratories that are testing the biological properties of lots and lots of trees to figure out which one does what. So modern science works with uh, first the science and then the technology, and the science is a model building exercise. You build a model, you build a model of chemistry, or whatever, or biology. Uh, and, and it's a theoretical model, and then you uh, validate it, and then you look, you find applications uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a technological sense. But in the, in the work we did uh, on, uh, uh, you know, wood steel and uh, uh, the history of it, uh, and, uh, you know, the metallurgy of uh, zinc, zinc distillation, for example, uh, we did not find theoretical texts that uh, we did not we did not find that uh, evidence that people had first developed theoretical models that would qualify as scientific models and then based on those models come up with engineering applications which is how modern modern technologies rests on science and science rests on model on on, on uh, model building yeah. so my question one of the things that i keep wondering uh, is how did what was the methodology because maybe you know, maybe we got to figure out that methodology and maybe that methodology is worth replicating also because in the past it produced a lot of good things where people, in fact, the, the people who were making zinc distillation in Rajasthan, when we look at the social uh, background of these people, they are today classified as scheduled caste, scheduled tribe. So they're not like some Brahmin type. They're not a theoretical... Uh, people who came up with the engineering application, they, they were artisans type. Uh, and, and this you'll find to be true for many technologies that the people who had those technologies were not theoretical people. Uh, so the, the bypassing theory into engineering, how was that done? That's a question I would like to pose. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I think... Uh... It's a very interesting point that you bring out because modern science, by definition, has this ability of the people to have a modeling behavior which precedes the experimentation, perhaps. And then, uh, in my take, possibly we Indians were empirical in the sense that we observed the patterns of behavior, looked at the possible experimentation that could be done, and then formulated some very good scientific basis-based uh, habits, attitudes, whatever. And your question is very nice because that's something which um, people do talk about a lot. But then I also want to interject and maybe I'd like to go to Professor B.S. Murthy. And before that, I would like to say there's this 
Madhva School of Mathematics in Kerala, which had been doing a lot of this theoretical modeling, if I may kind of say, so in the world of mathematics. So, Professor B.S. Murthy, what do you have to share with, to what uh, Rajiv ji is asking? Yeah, my feeling is the uh, way Indians, um, I think, knowledge grew is, uh, is through uh, more of uh, uh, oral way, you know, the way uh, right. uh, things were oral taught tradition. to students, oral tradition. Okay, so so uh, documenting things was possibly uh, not. Uh, I don't know for some reason maybe spiritually they felt it is not important or whatever could be uh, because uh, it, most of the Indian science was always connected to uh, the religious way of looking at. It. So there was never a segregation between these two and the so-called Maharshis that you talk about. They were also scientists. They also talked about science, and in fact, they, they always say that when you when you try to know about yourself, okay, you know everything about outside you also, and along with what is there inside you. So, so maybe that could be our. Uh, um, I would, if I would put it as a lacuna, okay, uh, from the from the Western perspective, Western people always believed in documentation, okay. So that's the reason why possibly now. Uh, how was a wood steel made? Uh, uh, how did they arrive at that particular composition that this would be the best composition to give such kind of a thing? Or the uh, pillar that our Lakshman was talking about, there was a lot of research done. Why is it not corroding? Okay, and there must have been a lot of uh, um, you know science that people might have tried uh, before coming up at that particular composition. But uh, I, I think uh, because we don't have documentation, it is very difficult to uh, you know comment on that very much now. Possibly, <laughs> but we can take it up now, uh, and then yes. that is where now we. For example, I can tell you a small thing. You know, you have a copper vessel at home. You take a lemon right. and then just uh, clean it, and all the rust is gone. Uh, when I was working right. with that particular Sanskrit scholar, when we were making copper nanoparticles, when we do an XRD X-ray diffraction. We were always getting a copper oxide along with the, the copper peaks. Immediately, he said, Murthy, you just put this uh, into a lemon juice. I put it oh. into lemon juice for five minutes, take the powder out, put, do an XRD. All the oxide peaks have vanished. It is pure copper peaks. Okay. So oh. this knowledge is something which is an amazing knowledge that I got. That Yes, people knew that this is uh, uh, like that. So, but the thing is, most of us, first of all, we, we cannot even go through the literature because, first of all, most of us don't know Sanskrit. That is one of the reasons why at IIT Hyderabad, now we started a series of Sanskrit courses. We have five wonderful Wonderful. courses of Sanskrit at IIT Hyderabad, where starting with the basics, by the time you come to the fifth course, you should be able to read olden scripts. And more Mm -hmm. interestingly is, if I can make my uh, B.Tech students uh, interested in that, that there is so much science, and if you read on, on that, maybe you will be able to uh, you know, grasp something and bring out something. And if you start doing experiments with all the modern, uh, you know, technology, I mean, uh, characterization tools that we have, we may be able to bring the science out and document it now and tell the world that yes, possibly it was not documented before, but now we are able to document it and tell you that this was all a science, not just a One kind more. of, uh, you know, yeah. uh, trial and error. And the fact that this oral traditions that were the basis of our knowledge systems repository in the minds of the people, perhaps that got disrupted out and that's why perhaps we do not know how they did the U steel, right? But then the documents that exist, the Sanskrit literature that exists, the manuscripts that exist, as you said, it's important for people to go to the original sources and read them up in that language itself to be able to benefit from it. And what you're doing is a stupendously, uh, what do you call, uh, appreciable activity, commendable activity in, time of, in, ter- in terms of getting the students at IIT Hyderabad to start studying Sanskrit from a certain scientific viewpoint. And that's really, really yeah, so nice. Uh, most of the people like who read Sanskrit in India, they looked at it from the religious perspective. Okay, I feel right. it is time that we look at all these scripts from a scientific perspective, and yeah, yeah. only scientists can do it. Okay, brilliant India. I, 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 I agree and I disagree there because I'll tell you what: 
earlier our rishis were having the strong scientific foundation as well as they led a holistic right. life they had both right. dimensions together the adhyatma was there the vijnana was there i think that's what we need to do that continuity is what's important on that note let me go to professor manivandan here professor manivandan what do you say to what professor uh, dr sri rajiv mahata asks for why is it that the modeling the theoretical modeling not proceed the empirical experimentations and the uh, applications thereof in our uh, contributions over the past several thousands of years i think it's a wonderful money on yes it's a wonderful question and uh, professor rajiv ji and uh, so th- the reason why i think is because we have understood uh, the word science and in a different way modern science is mostly by elemental science the one object okay. or one concept is broken into several several concepts smaller concepts so that it can be studied and uh, no uh, very well or like in a in a, in a controlled environment whereas our, our uh, uh, ancient science or whatever it is not a elemental science it's a holistic science an object is looked at as okay. it is for example one object there is a no, concept of panchabhuta every object in the universe is made up of this panchabhutas right. so once you understand this panchabhutas right then you don't have to even look at the deep tree they know what are its properties okay. where it could be applicable that level of abstraction is there at the holistic level abstraction is there not at the level of elemental so only if you break into the okay. element you need to do the modeling and simulation that what will happen and when uh, one object is interacting with the other object but at the holistic level uh, once the base is very strong then and uh, you know uh, all the interaction has that is what my understanding of uh, so the uh, thing beautiful no i think you brought out a very important point and that point is when you do theoretical modeling you are kind of objectifying in a very uh, different way whereas when you do this holistic way of looking at things you are bringing in a very important power of the mind called intuition and that's enabling one to zero in on those capabilities that can be immediately leveraged and that's something which i think uh, uh, modern science will want to kind of possibly emulate and uh, pull it together from our earlier uh, contributions so on that note let me go to professor um, uh, sampath kumar professor sampath kumar a quick uh, sound bite from you uh, what do you think actually is the reason why we do not have theory preceding our experimentation in our understanding of sciences and technologies professor sampath kumar thanks again thanks for uh, professor rajiv ji for a wonderful uh, uh, point for a discussion Uh, my view will be basically this learned uh, the word the uh, ancient people learned it by doing it experimental actually systematics okay i'll i'll, I'll appreciate with i'll give an example then i will explain more on it for example i've been contacted for making you know that uh, mercury first form match so look at the mercury okay. first form no they do a systematic procedure they grind it one day leave it for half a day grind it again they do it for a 10 days time okay. actually systematic manner and certain conditions actually they are not documented but i told also when okay. you, so i i been given thing to train for four hour you should grind it little but to keep on getting tired do not grind it for example if i use a modern technology what i do i put it in the milling and then get it done but the property is totally different by systematic and experimentally the observed thing which they missed to put document it these are the skills necessary they learn the skill they pass on next generation 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 some was not it this is exactly we have to look at it and do systematically what they done it and repeat the experiment and characters different level and document that's what you do you do i think uh, you really captured it in a nice way more than theorizing we are empirical experimenters of a big time where we could zero in on what we wanted very fast and that's a very important point maybe i should ask professor lakshman what do you have to say about this sir the the question asked by rajiv ji is very very thought provoking actually uh, and right. the answers came up mostly summarizes all the point which was put into it yes our uh, uh, ancestors had a high thinking capacity and working capacity in that they can think very fast so that is one thing that probably they think that it stays with them number one and second then learning is everything nature based they didn't okay. have a watch they used the sun right right so yep. they can even split of seconds they can say by looking at it that's one that's by learning by the nature point 
And second point, which as okay. I, I, all of the speakers also pointed out is for them, everything was very simple to look at and understand it in a complex way, abstract things very easily, number one. And they believed in the community of family transferring the knowledge from one generation to the other generation. That's the oral point which yeah. Professor B.S. Muthi yeah, pointed out. Transformation. Right. Even though we have the scripts, but one thing which we have had issues with our uh, country is it was very much diverse. A particular right. thing in Tamil will not be translated or will not be carried to the other side of the boundary because it is very diverse and it is very much uh, differently oriented. So transfer of this to one process is a unified thing. And of course, I agree with Professor Muthi, yes, there is a lacuna of documentation, but they thought it is not required because they can pass it through generations. Somewhere the chain broke. So we are looking at it as right. a lacuna. So, so, so that is the very interesting thing. So in order to be able to get in grips with the modern uh, ancient scientific and technological contributions, two things stand out. One is called identifying those oral traditions which might exist in families across the whole nation in several pockets. And that's very important, traditions and the practices. The second point which I kind of get to see is, and this is very important, is the fact that we are very, very big time intuitive experimenters who had the ability to come to the results which we wanted in a very fast way. And that is another thing which is critical. So the continuity of these oral traditions is the key to unlocking a lot of our heritage, it looks like. And that, on that note, I'd like to say that we are kind of coming to the end of this first episode. Can I, of can, can this I make a can, can I make a can yeah, I make yeah, some quickly, comments? Yeah, yeah, okay. please. So so uh, a counter example is that in uh -huh. Ayurveda there is a model. Uh, there is a right. model, the doshas, the dhatus, uh, you know, the different right. uh, layers of uh, tissues. Uh, there is a model of anatomy, which is not the same as uh, uh, you know the Western. So, for instance, Western won't know what is where is prana. You know, it, uh, they think it's prana is breathing, but prana is much more than breathing. Uh, similarly, the Chinese people I, I interact with them a lot, and they say that this uh, these meridians and this uh, uh, the, the, their idea of chi, which is analogous to prana, uh, they have a model, but it's in terms that uh, Western people don't consider legitimate. So. But in the area of uh, uh, in the area of uh, uh, Ayurveda, there is a model, and then you apply the model to this guy, that guy. He has this disease. How you diagnose is in terms of the model. You you diagnose right. a person, pulse, this, that, whatever. You diagnose it and you map it onto the model, and then you treat. So we do Wonderful. have that. The, the fact that it is oral did not by itself prevent model building. I ha I want to submit a different thesis. And I would like, uh, uh, you know, critical uh, feedback. Yeah, I'll thank Rajivji for uh, coming over to this panel, uh, Professor uh, B.S. Murthy, Professor Lakshman, Professor Mani Vannan, and Professor Sampath Kumar for discussing this very important issue, or if I might kind of say so, the theme of encouraging advanced student projects in leveraging our Indic Indian scientific and technological heritage. So thank you and we will soon be back.